Hello, my fellow Gadotians. Today we're taking a look at scopes and statics. Thanks to your feedback, I decided to zoom in a bit so that you could see the code a little bit more clearly. So let's get started. Scopes are a layer of symbols in the application. There are different types of scopes. You have the global scope that's available everywhere. The class scope, which has symbols that are available everywhere within the class, but then outside of the class, you have to go through the class in order to get to the symbols. And then finally, we have block scope. So blocks are also known as local scope. And it's basically a kind of block where you create something in the block, and then for the rest of that block, you have access to the symbol, um, but you might also have like other temporary symbols, for example, function scope, which is just another kind of block scope where you have symbols for the parameters that persist. But then outside of the block scope, you just don't have access to any of that stuff. So in GDScript, for global scope, we have engine symbols that are provided, right? So we have the label right here. Um, that's a, an engine class symbol. And then we also have this engine singleton, which is an instance symbol. And they're both provided by the engine, so you, they're just globally available. Um, but they do have, even within the engine stuff, distinctions between things that are classes and things that are instances. In the case of the instances, they're virtual classes that you don't actually have the ability to instantiate yourself. Um, whereas with the engine class symbols, they're just kind of building blocks that allow you to instantiate and use those types for the most part. There are a few virtuals like canvas item and container and that kind of stuff. Um, we also have autoload singletons, which you are probably familiar with. Um, you go to project settings and autoloads. You can give a name to a particular scene or node extending script. And then if you actually go to your project.godot file, you'll be able to see this little autoload section that has the name of the type pointing to the path to the resource. Um, you then get script classes, which you probably are familiar with using the class name keyword, where you give a global name to a particular script. Um, you can also define global names in this manner for native script resources. They actually have a section for the script class name and icon path. Um, and this actually gets your project.godot file to create a list of all these different types that you've generated. Um, these values can be fetched at runtime using project settings. So you can just get the array of um, dictionaries and then iterate through the list and create your own dictionary that maps the class name to a loaded version of the path. So you actually have the script resource. And then you can just say, hey, player.new, right? If you wanted to manually do this without using the um, traditional manner. Um, GDScript does generate global variables for all of these. So if you're in the GDScript language, you can just access them. But if you were using a different language, you'd have to use one of these methods. Um, more script class support is coming in future versions of Godot. Um, we plan on having different languages be able to define their own script class names for the scripts and then make it a little bit easier for every language to be able to get access to these things by name. So then we have class scope. Class scope is built into the file, right? Because the files are implicitly a class. And then you also have the ability to create your own class scopes with a class keyword followed by the name and then a colon. So for example, I've got my var data, which is in the class scope for this player class. And I have a print data method, which will print the data variable. Um, I can then create class helper and have it extend whatever the heck I want. And here I'm redeclaring data, print data, and it's doing the exact same thing. But note that this data and that data are completely different data. It has no awareness of the player data. And similarly for the print data method, like they're both class scopes that are completely independent of one another. Um, this is not so when we get to block scope as we shall soon see. The block scope is created in any other case where you would have a colon with indents. Um, that's for conditionals and match statements, any sort of loop, as well as function calls. So you create this little block of indented space after a colon where you can just kind of create variables or do whatever the heck you want, right? create additional nested blocks. Um, and unlike a class scope, the block scopes form a tree of nested symbols that can come into conflict with one another including with the class and global scopes. So here I have some the class, and I have a data variable that's in the class scope. And if I enter the function ready section, 
If I attempt to redeclare data, I'm going to get an error because it conflicts with the data that exists at the class level. But I can define a new symbol, right? So I have var x. Then I enter a nested block. So I'm in the function block. Now I'm in this conditional block. If I attempt to reference a new variable called x, if I attempt to declare a new variable, I'm going to come into conflict with the x that exists in the ancestral block, okay? But I can declare a new variable y. I then, if I try to print each of the different variables, they all work because they can all navigate up the hierarchy and find the respective symbols. But when I leave this block, y gets unloaded because this is the block where it was defined. And then in this block, even though if, I, if I'm if i creating the same kind of block with the same state, you know, I'm doing an if true just like I was before, that doesn't really make any difference. I'm still creating an entirely new block. So when I try to reference the Y, it's already unloaded and I get an error saying that it doesn't exist. So then once the ready function ends, we get this X being unloaded because that's where it was defined. But the data, which belongs to the class, still persists. And when I come into process, we have a function scope where we get this P delta parameter symbol that just automatically comes in defined. And now for the duration of this block, I can reference P delta. But when I when this block ends and I dedent, I now have the P delta symbol unloaded, so I can't reference it anymore. So that's kind of a quick summary of how scoping works in GDScript. Now in C++, you have the global scope versus curly braces scope, okay? So by default, you're just in global scope. Everything you do, like no matter what, you always come in in global scope. Um, new scopes only require curly braces. You don't have to force yourself to create an if statement or a loop or something like that. You can just create curly braces anywhere and make a, st make a scope and declare that some variable exists. And then for the duration of that scope, they all exist. But then when you leave the scope, the things declared within that scope cease to exist. And you end up with this Y here being unloaded. Now the C++ entry point is the global main function. We'll be covering function syntax in more detail later on, but I kind of need to mention it here. Um, so here's the int main function that returns zero. It's just what the function does. And I have actually before the main function, so before the entry point of the application, I've actually already got this global variable x defined. So as soon as I enter the entry point, I can just reference x because it's a global variable. And I can also have this integer y, which is in the block scope of the main function. And so once the application essentially terminates, the y gets unloaded. Um, if this were any other function, you would actually be able to re-mention you know, mention or modify the global variable data that exists outside of the function. So you'd be able to call the function multiple times and mutate um, the global data every single time, kind of like an autoload in GDScript. Or class, or class information if you're calling different methods on the same class or something. Um, all C++ control flow, all of it, um, conditionals, switches, which are kind of like matches, um, loops, and functions, all of them use curly braces and work exactly the same way. Um, so every time you enter one of those control flow spaces, you're creating a new block scope within the curly braces associated with them. Um, there's a little bit more nuance to that because you're not absolutely required to use curly braces, but we can get to that later. Um, so then there's also a concept of shadowing. So in GDScript, when we redeclared variables in a nested block, we got name conflicts. But in C++, this doesn't actually happen. Nested symbol duplication results in shadowing that hides the original symbol. So if I'm in this scenario here, I've got this bool x in the global scope. And when I enter this scope, I create an integer x, and it works, and it completely hides the existence of the bool x. So as long as I'm within this nested scope, I can make an identical symbol of x, and it just hides whatever is in the ancestral area. Okay, And I can re-enter another one, and I can make something of the same data type even, and it doesn't even matter. As long as the symbol is the same, you're going to stop referencing the outside one. So if I had another line of code in here that was attempting to access x, 
it would be accessing the x that exists within the scope rather than the one outside of the scope. Of course, if you attempt to redeclare something in the same scope, then you'll get a redeclaration error. So, um, some languages like F# -sharp or Rust do support redeclaring in the same scope. So here I'm actually making like different variables that are all um, or sorry, I'm redeclaring the same variable with different uh, expressions, and I'm even using the variable in subsequent expressions to kind of build more and more complicated versions of the same data. Um, you can do that sort of thing in those languages. So declarations and definitions. Um, in C++, there's a difference between declaring that a symbol exists versus defining what that symbol actually is. Um, you can declare a type with a definition all at once, which is what we've been seeing so far. Um, but you can also just separately say, hey, I have a struct of this name. And then later on, you know, I have to have this semicolon here to terminate it. And then later on, I redeclare the same type name, but with the curly braces and semicolon that contains the full definition of the class. So why would we ever want to do this? Well, Unfortunately, C++ is really like C with classes, kind of. Um, it's a little bit more than that, but because of that inheritance, it's really a procedural language that just happens to have object orientation. So types are still defined one after another in order rather than all at once. So here I have class node, and I has a pointer to a scene tree instance. And then I have a class scene tree with a pointer to a node instance. But because I haven't defined that scene tree exists when I'm declaring the node, I, I don't know what a scene tree is. So it's not, it's not defined, so I get an error. And then because there's an error with the node definition, I can't use node in the definition of the scene tree because it can't define node in the first place. So how do we fix this? We use forward declarations, right? So here I have my forward declaration of the class, where we're declaring the class first and stating that the class exists. And then I'm creating the node class that is referencing the type name scene tree. And the compiler just says, hey, you told me that this thing exists already. So, OK, I'll trust you that it exists and I'll let you reference the name. You just can't reference anything inside of it, right? None of the members or methods can be referred to. But as long as you promise me that you'll eventually tell me what a scene tree is, I don't really care. And so we eventually get to that point where we define the scene tree and the compiler is happy. And at that point, we've already got a valid declaration for the node type, so we can now refer to node inside the scene tree declaration. Uh, note that C Sharp and Java, since they're fully object oriented, um, not really procedural at all, they will kind of automatically figure out which dependencies they need to load things in the proper order, and they kind of take all that work out of the developer's hands, um, which is why a lot of people like using those for enterprise development and stuff. So, static and the scope operator. This is the next thing. So, how do we answer the question? how many instances of a class have we made, right? One way to figure that out would be to use a static variable. So static means that a class owns the symbol rather than instances of the class. If you have multiple instances, they're all actually sharing access to the same thing that all belongs to the class. So let's, let's dive into what that means. So here, um, I have a struct counter, and I have a variable declaration for a static int. Um, in this case, the keyword static is not a qualifier for the data type int. It's actually a qualifier for the symbol count. I know it kind of sucks that static is put before the data type because it seems like it's part of the data type, but it's really not. It's part of the symbol count. Okay, You just happen to put it before the data type. Um, we also have an example here of something called a constructor, which is a special function that gets run every time an instance of the um, counter class is created. We'll get into more details about that stuff later, but for now, suffice to say that this expression here, or a statement, uh, count plus equals one, is going to execute every single time we create an instance of the counter class. 
So the next thing we have to do is say that int counter colon colon count, we'll get into that, uh, is equal to zero. So I'm defining and initializing this variable that we created in our counter class. So then when we get into the main entry fun function, this variable has already been initialized to zero. And every time we create an instance of the counter class, it's triggering this logic, which is increasing this static count by one. And this data is part of the class. So it's not like we're getting a new count every time we make a new instance. The data is part of the class. So they all share references to the same piece of data. So how do we get to this data, right? Well, I can't just take C and do dot to get the count because C doesn't actually have any member called count. And you also can't use counter dot count because even though it's part of the class, the dot operator doesn't really work with that. Um, so whenever you're accessing something inside of a class that belongs to the class, you have to use counter colon colon count, right? The colon colon operator is what you use here. So things to note, uh, I already covered the static keyword goes before the data type of the declaration. Um, I'm happening to use a constructor function during the instantiation, but we'll go into more detail. And then we have the scope operator, colon, colon, which allows us to access the static declarations. These are the key points from this code example. Now, the static member variable has to be defined or initialized outside of the class definition. It's not, it's not inside of the class. Um, and we'll get into more soon. So pay special attention to the definition of the count member variable, right? So we have this int count colon, uh, counter colon colon count equals zero. This is actually no different than if we did int count equal to zero. And here's the reason why. The syntax hasn't actually changed. We have the data type, we have the symbol, the assignment operator, and the value expression, and the semicolon, okay, whatever. Um, so by default, we're in the global namespace. And a namespace is kind of a scope for type names. So we can have classes and structs and enums. Those are all different kinds of type names. Um, they're that domain of things that GDScript doesn't really have, right? And uh, the symbol that we want, count, is part of counter. So we must enter its space with colon colon before the symbol becomes visible to us to, to use from the global namespace. So why do we have to define it separately though? Well, if I say struct counter and I have my static int count, I'm declaring it here and I'm defining it here. But when counter is created, so is count. Count is part of the class. So the moment we declare and have this semicolon statement in the counter, we're also immediately creating the count. So we have to define, like, what is the initialization of this thing? Well, counter is defined in the global namespace, so too must the count be defined in the global namespace. It just so happens that count belongs to counter, not the global namespace, hence the need to get to that name through the counter class, because it's scoped to the counter class. If we were, like, already inside of the counter class, then we would already be able to refer to count natively, but we're not, we're in the global namespace. Now you can access the global namespace manually using the scope operator with no prefix. So here I create a global variable called count and I set it equal to 10. And then during this constructor, I set count plus equal to colon colon count. So here, this count is referring to the count that's part of the class because I'm inside the context of the class and I don't need to specify which counter I'm trying to get to. But then here, if I don't put this colon colon, I'll be accessing this count. But because I'm prefixing it with colon colon, I'm announcing that I want to go straight to the global namespace first, kind of like an absolute path with files. And I'm saying, no, no, I want the top level count. So then I get this value, which ends up meaning that every time I create a new instance of counter, it's now going up by 10 because I'm increasing it by this value rather than one. It's also possible to manually create your own namespaces. So here I have a global int 10 and I create a namespace with the namespace keyword. I can just arbitrarily nest these however deep I want. 
And then I have global int going up by five. And then I can just say data colon colon integers colon colon stuff colon colon x. And I can get to this nested namespaced variable called x. And if I'm increasing it however I want, you know, maybe I'm like, you know, I don't really want to deal with having to go into this nest stuff so much. It's I need an alias, right? It's just bothersome. So I can say namespace dis is equal to the same namespace that's nested several layers. And now I can just say dis colon colon x and access the same thing, similar to how aliases work with um, scripts in GDScript. Uh, it's also kind of similar to a type def, although not quite the same. So uh, what if we're getting tired of writing you know, these aliases all the time, or if we're tired of constantly doing the colon colon, and we just want to say, you know what, I want to get to this data that's inside of the data namespace, and I don't want to have to do data colon colon a whole bunch. So I'll just say using data. And now I've essentially gone into the namespace and brought everything out into whatever namespace I'm in. And for the duration of this namespace, I can freely access anything inside the data namespace. Well, it just so happens that I happen to be in the global namespace. So I've essentially turned all of the data variables into global variables. So now I can just say Y plus C and I can bring them in however I want. You can see more differences about static class members and namespaces, as well as uh, how templates affect that, and we'll cover those later um, in the notes. There's a lot more to go into with that stuff. So statics in GDScript. Okay? Here's a little thought exercise. Godot specifically does not support static data in scripting for thread safety reasons. Um, however, Godot's scripted classes aren't really the same thing as C++ classes. They are script resource instances, right? And we've already illustrated this before because GDScript lets you create aliases with them as values, right? I can just create a class and then I can assign the class to a variable as a value. Um, all Godot objects, including the resource and script types, have this ability to read and write runtime metadata using the set meta and get meta methods. And you can combine this with a script class to kind of do pseudo static data um, because GDScript will just automatically create global variables out of the script classes. So you have these always loaded resources that you can just mess with for metadata. So here's an example where I have this static class name reference type, and then I could just set meta and get meta on static to just arbitrarily create key value pairs of data. And the keys have to be strings. They can't be other things. So that's a limitation of it. Um, and it, there are a couple of other limitations that we'll get into, but uh, that is conceivable. Um, however, you can do something similar with auto loads, right? So here I make a node that's static.gd and I auto load name it static. And so now I create a little meta dictionary that's part of it. And I can do the exact same thing, more or less. I can just say static meta and then set and get values on it, just like I could with these methods. The differences are actually quite a bit. So like, which one should you use? You have access to autoload's ability to just be a node instance rather than a resource's metadata. You've got the non-stick members, methods, and signals, as well as constants. Um, you have the second keyword. You have statically typed data because the metadata is inherently untyped, so you have no way of forcing it to be a particular type. Um, I didn't list here, but um, you actually have different kinds of keys that you can use. You're not limited to strings for the data. And then you also have access to get tree because the node. So you can get the scene tree, which means you can get the entire node tree, node groups, delta time, input events, anything that has to go with the ongoing instance of the game. And you also have data serialization support because the metadata stuff is mostly for runtime information. And here you actually have the ability to easily save and load whatever data you're working with. So while pseudo static data is possible in GDScript, it's not really preferable to just using a singleton when you can. So I figured that was kind of good to go over. <laughs> um, more statics. Okay, so GDScript does support static functions. And this can actually be really useful. 
Um, so here I actually have a class name util, and I create a static function called get author that returns my name, right? And I can, you know, I can. This is just a contrived example. You can have all kinds of really, really great static functions. Um, but the great advantage here is that you don't need to create a particular instance of this util class. Like, why even bother creating an instance when I can just directly say util dot get author, and I can just call it on the script. C++ actually supports the same thing. Um, we'll get into function syntax more in detail later, but just like before where I had a static variable, I can also create static fu functions. So here I have static const char pointer get author, and it's returning a char pointer, right? This, this data type that is a sequence of characters, my C string, and I can just have this part of my util class. So I create an instance of the util, and then I can say util colon colon get author. If I try to do the util instance with a dot, I'll get an error because get author is a static function. But it's also kind of annoying that like people are even capable of creating an instance because we're not really using it for instance information. But there is a way to prevent that. We can just say a static struct util. I can I can make the class itself static which in turn makes it possible for me to block people from creating instances of the class. Oh yeah. So unfortunately, that's not really the end of scopes in C++. Uh, when we learn inheritance, and there'll, there'll be a lot more to learn because you've got the this variable for the actual instance and how that is different from any of the other stuff you might be able to access in a scope. Uh, we have multiple inheritance and how that can affect different things, be able to get fields from different classes. It gets really, really complicated, um, but that'll be for another time. So appreciate you guys sticking around for the episode. It's a little bit long, but it's pretty good, I hope. Uh, very quick and informative. Uh, if you have any suggestions or feedback, I appreciate hearing everything you guys have to say. So um, the information, as always, is always available on my uh, Deconstructing Godot GitHub repository. And I hope to see you guys in the next episode.